uh, first of all, the title is Designing for Student Uptake of Feedback in Higher Education. And I guess Professor Carlos needs no introduction. Mm -hmm. He is a friend in the University of Hong Kong. He is a friend <coughs> in the field of assessment for learning, particularly in the area of feedback literacy. So please welcome Professor Carlos. Okay, great to be here, thank you. Uh, I'll use the microphone because I've got a three hour class this afternoon and I've got AD, um, but it's good to be here. Um, I don't know if many of you know that I used to be an EAP teacher. Um, it was a long time ago, um, but I did a year in Poly U and I did a couple of years in Baptist, um, to say quite a few years ago. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is sort of assessment for learning and feedback issues um, today. Um, there's the title, and if you want to join the Twitter conversation along with uh, Phil Smith and Ivan Chong, there's my, my Twitter handle. Okay, um, these are kind of the themes that I'm going to try to address. Um, I'll explain why I like to use the term learning-oriented assessment. Um, the key theme is going to be designing feedback, designing. It doesn't just happen that you do some marking at the end and the students are going to find this very engaging. There needs to be a design. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about exemplars and we'll talk a little bit about peer feedback and of course there will be some challenges and implications. Um, this, I think, summarizes some of the big challenges in assessment. Your hub is focusing on the orange circle, the assessment for learning or formative assessment, but you've got that big brother at the top in red, the summative assessment, the assessment of learning, the judging student achievement. And from the student point of view, as you know, the grey is the crux of the matter. So if we're trying to embed assessment for learning ideas, how are we going to tackle that big brother at the top, the summative, the grade, the thing that really matters? So this is why I prefer the term learning-oriented assessment. Because learning-oriented assessment is trying to cut through the assessment for learning, assessment of learning distinction and saying all assessment should be focused on student learning. And this encompasses good summative assessment as much as formative assessment, assessment for learning. So it's kind of suggesting that actually we need to rehabilitate the summative, the assessment of learning, so that we are setting rich assessment tasks and rich assessment designs that students are actually going to generate some learning function from. And it's kind of encapsulated in this diagram that I've sort of played around for nearly 15 years now. Um, it starts at the top with productive assessment task design, which is very much in the teacher's hands. So the teacher is going to design a task or probably even better, a series of assessment tasks. And through doing those tasks, we hope that the students will be developing those two key capacities at the bottom of the diagram. So we want assessment tasks and designs that will help students to appreciate what quality is. Students cannot produce good work unless they have some sense of what a good performance is. So in EAP, if you're writing a report, or you're doing an oral presentation, or you're trying to write some kind of disciplinary essay, you need to have some kind of sense of what is a good presentation, what is a good essay, what is a good report, what is a good portfolio. 
So I think that's one of the most valuable things we can do, is to teach students and help them to acquire the nature of good performance. So that's the bottom left. And on the right hand side, student engagement with feedback. And engagement is the critical issue. Because we all know there's a lot of marking that's being done that isn't leading to any engagement. There's a lot of comments, marking, feedback that isn't really connecting. So we need to design assessment and feedback in ways in which students can learn the feedback literacy skills to identify the nature of good quality work and can develop the skills in, in kind of uh, sharing feedback messages through peer feedback, through listening to peer feedback, listening to teacher feedback, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about analysing exemplars, because I think exemplars are a site for appreciating what quality is. And through comparing exemplars with your own work, you're also generating some feedback. So this, this diagram is kind of a framework that is underpinning uh, the whole talk. And I used that framework in this book um, that came out in 2015. And what I did is I researched teachers who'd won awards for excellence. In all the universities we have these uh, teaching excellence awards. So. I looked at five different disciplines, uh, architecture, geology, history, law, business, and I actually went into the classroom, it was a very interesting experience, sitting in these disciplinary classrooms with the students, trying to see how the uh, learning-oriented assessment was emerging. Okay, so in the next part I'm going to try to situate feedback and try and tease out some of the key issues. This is a critical and challenging point. Uh, Dylan William is one of the world's experts on formative assessment. He's also one of the top educational researchers in, in the world. So I think whatever he says, we should heed it. Feedback should be more work for the student than the teacher. How often is that the case in your practice? You know, we sit at home and we spend so many hours doing the marking, we give it back to the students, they have a quick look, they see the grade, put it in their bag, or even worse, it goes in the rubbish bin. Um, what Dylan Williams says is, if you think it is worthwhile for you to spend all that time doing this marking, you must then design some activities where students have an opportunity to follow up. If you're just doing this marking and then you're not doing anything, well, why should they do anything? Um, so he says, design some learning activities in class when the students, maybe they develop an action plan, how they're going to follow up on the feedback, maybe they do even another version, another iteration, they discuss in groups, they share different kinds of feedback. Um, so I think that's a challenging point, but I think it's really worth thinking about how we can make the students less active, and I'm sure you'd be happy to have a bit less work to do at the same time, but I think it's more activating the student, and that will be another key theme. So, it's only feedback if it actually leads to some kind of student action. Blanche and her team, they sent me a few questions in advance, and one of the questions uh, was a very good one. How do we get students to engage with feedback? How do we get students to engage with feedback? Well. What's the most important thing from the student point of view? From the student point of view, the most important thing is the grade. So, give your feedback before the final grade is awarded. So, task one, feedback. Task two, portfolio, where there is feedback embedded within the process. So, anything that comes at the end of the module after the feedback, sorry, after the grade is awarded, is going to be of very little use to the students. You know that and the students will tell you that. I've done a lot of research with students. They say, we don't want a lot of comment after it's finished and the grade is awarded. We want it during. 
and they're very happy to have less half done and more job. Now, of course, it isn't that easy for you because of this one. You know, you've got to satisfy the accountability needs, so maybe you worry that you'll get into trouble, or somebody will complain, or the external examiner will say, where is all the feedback? But if we're thinking in a learning-oriented way, we are trying to generate uptake. Um, so we need to provide the comments when the students can use them. And it isn't that easy in higher education, because as you know, assignments tend to come at the end, so it's very difficult. So we need to re-engineer the tasks and the processes and embed the peer feedback so students can use the feedback. There's also a danger that the more feedback you give, the more the students become dependent on you. For many years in this university, I used to teach uh, a course, an, an M.A. course, English language curriculum. And we had what we thought was quite a nice assignment. We asked the students to choose a topic in their school. You know, M.A. students are usually practicing teachers in the school. So we asked them to choose a curriculum topic in their school that they were interested in to collect some data, to do some analysis and make some recommendations. So there was a bit of choice and flexibility. The teachers would choose a topic that made sense to them in their curriculum. I usually like to go to class a little bit early, it gets set up and then I can talk to the students a bit. And um, one of the students, um, she came to me one week and she said to me, uh, for my assignment I'm thinking of doing X, uh, this is what I'm thinking of doing, what do you think? And I said, yeah, sounds good. And then I, I thought to be a professional teacher, I should give her a couple of bits of feedback. And I said, well, maybe you could consider this, maybe one of the challenges would be that. And I thought, oh, that was good feedback. Next week, I went along to class, the same student came up to me and she said, actually, after talking to you last week, I've changed my topic. I now want to do topic Y, uh, what do you think of that? And I said, yeah, topic X was fine, topic Y is also good, uh, maybe you should think about A and B and C. Next week, she comes up to me again and said, well, actually, after talking to you last week, um, I've changed my topic and I want to do something else. At this point, I said to her, I think maybe you should just do it on your own. I think any more comments from me are not helping too much. And then I just kind of left her to it. Um, so I think there's a danger sometimes that the more feedback you give them, the more anxious they become, and the more they feel they need to keep going to you again and again to sort of um, satisfy their anxieties. Um, and then I thought, well, did I do a bad job there? Or is it just that student? And then a few years later, uh, a former colleague, Fiona Highland, who's also pretty good at feedback, she was telling us a story that was a bit similar. She said, the more feedback I give the students, the more anxious they could get, and the more they want to come back to her more and more times and ask her more and more things. So she was wondering what to do. What I think we should do is use more interrogative feedback. Questions. I think I should have said to that student, if you're doing a project like this, maybe you would like to think about a, B, C, a phrase as questions. I think there's a danger when we say to a student, I think maybe you should do X or maybe you should do Y. It sort of increases this learned helplessness. And this is supposed to be an image of a guy sort of working it out on his own. Um, because what we're trying to do with feedback is not to tell the students what to do, but to try to get them to work it out for themselves. And again, I think that's difficult. Because I think as teachers we feel we want to share our knowledge and our expertise. We do want to tell them stuff. But I think feedback as telling actually has a lot of limitations to it. It needs to be stimulating and moving it on. I don't know about you guys, but have you ever tried telling your parents to change their lifestyle or changing your husband or your wife to do something differently? It doesn't work very well, does it? <laughs> So I think we're trying to stimulate this kind of internal feedback, this kind of self-monitoring that we all do. 
So I'm kind of thinking, well, we started a bit late. Am I going quick enough? Is the audience engaged? How are we going along? And when students are working on assignments, they're thinking, well, do I need a bit more here? Do I need a bit less here? Do I need to add some more reading? Do I need to cut this, etc., etc.? The good students are able to do this pretty well. The weaker students are not very good at this self-monitoring. So I think we have to try to train them because this is essential for lifelong learning. So what I've argued for in some of my research is what I call sustainable feedback. If they always need the teacher to tell them you're on the right track, you need to proofread, you need to do this, it's not sustainable. Sustainable feedback enables the students to generate feedback, to self-evaluate and to use feedback as part of self-regulated learning. And more recently I've developed this framework for student feedback literacy. Because in order for the students to do some of these nice things I've been talking about, they need to have some capacities. So on the left hand side, the idea of appreciating feedback. Understanding feedback purposes, understanding the potential benefits of feedback, what you can learn from it. In the middle, making judgments. So the internal feedback, the peer feedback, the exemplars are all to do with making judgments. <coughs> on the right hand side, by managing affect, I mean managing the emotions. So not being too discouraged by failure or critical feedback. Having the sort of the strength of mind, the strength of morale to sort of overcome the, the many challenges that we have. And these are all converging on the idea of taking action at the bottom of the figure. One of the very nice questions your team sent me before the talk was, can feedback literacy be taught explicitly? That's a lovely question. I have a feeling the process of making judgments can be taught. I have a feeling that the other two, appreciating the value of feedback and managing affect, need to be modelled rather than taught. Um, with some of my doctoral students, I give them examples of, of some of the reviews I get from journals. And the kind of journals I'm submitting to only accept about 15 to 20 percent of their papers. So obviously I'm getting more failure than more success. And the students tell me they find this quite comforting um, to, to realize that somebody who seems seems relatively successful, you're a professor in Hong Kong U, but you're getting rejected more times than not. And I show them some of the comments that the, student, that the reviewers make, and if you've ever been on the receiving end of reviewer comments, because it's anonymous, because it's, it's interpersonal, it's sort of um, not, not very personalized, some of the comments can be pretty, pretty harsh. Uh, so I, I share some of these with them. So making judgments, I think you can teach but the other ones, I think you have to model them. The next sort of little strand is to do with dialogue around exemplars, and dialogue is the key word. So what are exemplars? Obviously enough, they are samples. They do not have to be exemplary. So your samples could be a range of quality. Maybe some excellent, very good, and then maybe some not so good. Usually assignments from the previous Award. And this fills in the box in my framework of appreciating quality. Through analyzing exemplars, and analyzing is what we want them to do, we want them to look at the exemplars, consider the strengths and weaknesses and how they can be improved. They're learning these feedback literacy capacities of making judgments. <coughs> we also believe that exemplars help students to engage with feedback. Because exemplars provide a bit of a window into the teacher analysis regime, the teacher commentary. So we think that through analyzing the feedback, sorry, through analyzing the exemplars, students learn to appreciate the meaning of some of these difficult terms like criticality, synthesis, depth, 
Because if you say to a student, you need a more in-depth analysis, they often don't know how to be in-depth or what in-depth is. But if you can show them an in-depth analysis and tease out some of the factors, I think that's a very valuable process. So the rationale for using exemplars is that they show rather than tell. They make some of the tacit understandings of the teacher somewhat more explicit. And they clarify expectations. The other thing is they clarify expectations for the students. You know, from the student point of view, the worst thing if you don't really know what the teacher is looking for. Particularly if it's a slightly innovative assessment class and it's a bit different to what they're used to doing. So the exemplar can also do this great job of clarifying the expectations for the students. Now I think I know your big objection to sharing exemplars. We think that students will see them as a model or they will just copy them. I think we have several strategies to try to minimize that. The first strategy is, if it works for you, your exemplar can be a slightly different task to what the real task is. So one of my teammates, he wanted his teacher education students to do a reflective piece. So the exemplar was one kind of reflection, a reflection on a certain kind of topic, and then the real assignment was a different kind of reflection. So they learned the kind of skills of a reflective piece of writing, but they, they couldn't copy it because it was a different kind of task. Some people tell me that doesn't always work in that situation. So I think another key point is the dialogue. Through the dialogue, you're trying to tease out the issues. But to me, a third more fundamental point is what do you guys do? If you're doing something new, you've been told by your boss you need to apply for a research grant you've never done before, what would be the first thing you'd do? You'd reach out to your colleagues and say, well, who got one of these grants before? Maybe a few years ago when we were introducing outcome-based, we all looked for a template of how you fill in the form of what your outcomes are. So we do it. What was the first thing you did when you started doing your doctoral thesis? First thing most people do is they have a look at some other doctoral thesis to see kind of what they look like. Yeah. I'll, I'm sure I. I'm sure Ivan will do the business in a little while. So, so yes, this copying thing is an issue, but I, I think we can we can try and overcome it. Another strategy is get the students to do a draft or an outline or something or part of the task before you you show them the outline. So I, I think this is an issue, but I think we can we can overcome it. So the dialogue, it's this, so what we usually do, thanks. Good, brilliant, thanks so much. Um, what we usually do with exemplars is we get the students hopefully to read them at home, then we usually put them in a group and we ask them to discuss the exemplars, and then we come to the difficult bit. The teacher has to then elicit from the students um, what are the key issues in the exemplars? The first time I did this, it, worked, it went very badly. It was a bit unlucky, really. I, it was about 20 years ago. I was working with some in-service English teachers, and we wanted them to do a kind of action research, action learning project in their school. And this was a bit scary to them. They didn't really know how to do it. So I thought, ah, show them the expectations and I chose from the previous cohort some grade A assignments, some really good assignments. And I distributed them uh, to the groups. And then I let them discuss for a while. And then I said, what do you think? And I still have nightmares about this. There was a guy at the front, very, very vociferous, a kind of old school, middle-aged uh, English teacher. And he said, there's a typo in the first paragraph of this assignment. And what is worse, Dr. Carlis, is you didn't mark it. 
What's going to happen to English language standards in Hong Kong? These English teachers, they make mistakes. And then these teachers in whatever institution I was in at the time, they don't spot them. And I was a little bit flummoxed. Now I'm a bit more experienced, I would have known to say, well actually, is quality, is it just a typo? Or is quality something a bit more holistic? And what is a quality report? And what are the good points? But I, I was a little bit shaken. And of course the other students, they were kind of nodding their heads and saying, yes, there's a grammar mistake, this is a crime. So I kind of felt the momentum was a little bit against me. So um, I have a lot of sympathy with people who, who struggle with, with the dialogue. And is it better to just keep it very tightly structured and just give a lecture without letting the people talk? Um, ah, Phil Smith, there he is. There he is. Here we are, dialoguing about exemplars in, in a very serious way. And I'd like to acknowledge... Um, <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge Phil's uh, current ongoing research because he's doing a very nice study of how teachers manage the use of exemplars in EAP. He's using constructivist grounded theory and he has 12 EAP teachers in a university not far from here. Um, 12 is a pretty good number for this kind of study, I think. And he's found what I think are three kind of from a continuum from fairly tightly structured to a bit more open. So the first group of teachers, they don't want the dialogue to go out of control like they did in my uh, early class. They want to sort of keep, keep things under control. Hey kids, this is what you should be looking for. These are the good points. Um, the second one is a little bit more exploratory. And the third one is a little bit more dialogic, a bit more emancipatory, but maybe a bit more more risky. Um, so through dialogue, you can enable the student voice. You can get the students to try to make sense of the rubric, make sense of the criteria, and you're trying to see the student self-regulation. So it isn't easy, but I think we should persevere. Because actually, when the students have a misconception, such as the typo is the biggest thing, it's actually good for us to air that issue and actually to discuss it and tease it out. Because students do have misconceptions and the dialogue is aiming to try to, to minimize those kind of misconceptions. So we're hoping Phil is going to kind of build on this paper that Kennedy Chan and I did, which was sort of talking about how we might manage the dialogue. And after my previous experiences, I said, Kennedy, you, you be the case. And, and Kennedy is actually very skillful at handling the dialogue. He's very good at responding neutrally to the students. Whatever the students will say, he will just say, oh, that's interesting. But he won't kind of say that's good or bad. He tries to get the students to think for himself. Um, so from his work, we, we figured that there are three or four key issues, and I've summarized some of them here. That the exemplar dialogue is trying to get the students to express their thinking or reasoning about the exemplars. And we actually welcome diverse viewpoints. And we actually welcome having a debate where different students will think that different exemplars are better or worse for different reasons. So in the last five minutes or so, just the final theme, I want to make a few comments about peer feedback. Because I think peer feedback is something we do quite often, but I worry that it often doesn't work very well. Or there are quite mixed uh, experiences. Sometimes when I'm teaching a group like this, somebody will say, oh, well, I did it and it worked really well. Somebody else will say, well, I did it and it worked really badly. So um, again, quite a long time ago, with, um, with Fan Yu, who's um, teaching English and Chinese Yu now, we had a, a paper, and some people told us they quite liked the title, Peer Feedback, the Learning Element of Peer Assessment. And one of our main arguments is, students tend to resist peer assessment with grades, because they don't like grading their friends, and they don't think their friends can grade appropriately. So we argued for comments, peer comments, without grades, 
as opposed to having grades. But other people disagree. Some people say they've done peer assessment and it makes it more motivating. Um, in that paper, we defined peer feedback as dialogues related to performance and standards. And I think that's still quite a useful way of looking at it. And in the applied linguistic literature, they often talk about peer response. I think this is a critical issue that we need to sell to the students a bit better. The reason we're doing peer feedback is not that we think your partner is going to give you some brilliant insight. They generally don't. But through the process of examining somebody else's work, you should get a deeper awareness of your own strengths and weaknesses. And by seeing what other folks can do better or worse than you, it's trying to seed this kind of self-review strategy, this kind of internal feedback. Surely one of your biggest frustrations is they are so weak at proofreading and they make the same mistakes over and over again. If we can somehow motivate them and train them to do better in the self-review, we may be minimizing those kind of issues. So, in peer feedback, you're both composing and receiving feedback. And the literature, interestingly enough, suggests that it's the composing that is richer than the receiving. And if we think about that, I think it makes sense. In order to compose peer feedback, you need to analyze, you need to detect strengths and weaknesses, you need to detect problems, and then you need to suggest how the problems can be tackled. So composing peer feedback, if done well, is quite a cognitively rich process. And if you've ever reviewed for journals or reviewed for any other internal or external purpose, you'll know that it's quite a rich kind of activity. I think we need to sell that better to the students. Because if you're the best student in the class, you may well think, I'm not going to get any useful peer feedback. But if you realize that through analyzing somebody else's, you'll get self-awareness, I think that's quite a powerful message. There's some good technology possibilities as well, and peer mark within the Turnitin in uh, Swede. I'm actually thinking of doing a project uh, in this same UGC funding later this year, uh, putting in for bids. So if anybody's interested in the use of technology in peer feedback, um, please drop me a line. The one idea I particularly like, audio and video feedback are becoming quite a common trend. But I worry that the teacher giving audio feedback, the teacher giving video feedback, is still kind of in the old paradigm of teacher telling, teacher telling. So I like this study by Hung in Taiwan, where the peer feedback was done through video and facilitated through Facebook. And students love Facebook, so it seemed like a nice idea. It seemed, seemed to work quite well. As you know, though, peer feedback often doesn't work well if the students aren't motivated or they don't take it seriously. And sometimes they tend to prefer the authoritative teacher feedback. Professor Min in Taiwan has done some fantastic work. She usually publishes in Journal of Second Language Writing. And she has a very systematic process of training the students to do peer feedback. So before she asks them to do it, she takes them through the steps, has an example, and then she coaches them how to do peer feedback better, she gives them examples, etc., etc. So just to summarize the key recommendations on peer feedback, sell the rationale benefits to students, communicate the gains for the giver, the composer of peer feedback, provide training, modeling, and support within a collaborative climate. <coughs> okay, just the last two minutes. One of the main themes has been that feedback needs to be designed. Reduce some of that teacher commentary that comes right at the end after the grade has been um, awarded. Reduce that in favor of peer feedback, guidance, exemplars during the process. Oh, there's another book coming out. Um, we're going to be talking about these kind of things in our new book. Um, they've changed the title, but it's in press and it'll be out in the summer, so we look forward
forward to that. And there you go. My daughter is a black belt in Taekwondo, so I have to behave when I'm at home. So if you want to be black belt in assessment for learning, these are three final recommendations. Develop effective assessment and feedback designs. Engage students in dialogue around exemplars and getting a sense of quality. And sell and coach and students in carrying out peer feedback. The references are there. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. We have time to pick one or two questions. Phil, do you want to continue your PhD teacher student dialogue? Please tell me when you're ready. <laughs> Give me lots of feedback on how I'm improving myself. <laughs> uh, I wanted a quick question, this is a very short one. You mentioned your um, Kennedy's uh, approach to dealing with mm. um, the exemplars, he sort of withholds those comments at the end, doesn't really say whether he agrees or disagrees what the students are saying. I wonder if you could comment a little bit on that and whether you feel that is a, uh, a good approach or whether you feel that actually sort of summarising what the students are saying and, and taking some sort of view, some sort of stance on what they've mentioned is, is better or more productive. Yeah, I mean, I, I do that. Um, I try to, to build on what they've said and I I do try, to, I, I actually state explicitly whether I think they're on the right track or not. Um, so when I observed his class, and the student sometimes said something really, really smart and really good, but he said the same, he gave the same reaction he did to when they said something not very good. And I just wondered whether the students feel a bit puzzled. Um, but when I thought about it more, I can think actually there is a quite a strength to what he's doing because his whole philosophy is he wants the students to work things out for themselves he wants the students to learn how to make judgments um, I think it's just a different way of doing it and I think both both are fine and I suppose the key message is as teachers we have to do what we feel comfortable with and we have to do what makes sense to us so he's got a position and a rationale for it but I think he's slightly unusual but as a sort of reflective person, he's making me think a little bit. And I have a feeling sometimes as teachers, we do make too many judgments and too quickly. And actually opening up the floor to the students, I think is, is actually very powerful. And I think it actually has a kind of lifelong learning aspect to it. Um, and when I interviewed the students, they were, they were quite sympathetic to what he was doing. They said sometimes it's a bit frustrating, but we like the fact that he's challenging us to think and he wants us to make our own decisions. So they didn't all like it, but they could see um, they could see what it was trying to do. Um, so it's good, but the other end would be too explicit, because you said you prefer something more interrogative. Yeah. yeah. Interrogative <coughs> students, but if you're too explicit in that discussion phase, then maybe that's kind of working against students, working things out, isn't it? They're I think it is. Just I, I think wait that's... Wait for you to tell them that's the right thing, and they're not yeah. the right, right answer. And yeah. Um, I'll tell you a little story. I mean, I, I was in a project a long time ago that involved peer observation. And uh, so I was the teacher and I had a colleague in the class with me. And when I, when I was a young teacher, when I was doing my teaching practice, my supervisors often praised me for being quite good at the interaction with the class and quite good at thinking on my feet and quite good at answering questions. And in this class, uh, a student asked me a question and I gave what I thought was a pretty good answer. And I was sort of quite pleased with myself, like a young teacher would be. Um, and then afterwards, my peer said to me, what you did was quite good. You elicited a question from the audience, and then you gave a pretty good answer. But she said, did you ever think, instead of answering the question, saying to the student, what do you think? And I've always remembered that, because I've done that now quite often, and I find it actually works much better. Because by saying, what do you think, before you answer the student question. You can understand better where the student is coming from, and you can therefore tailor your question better, but you're also getting, giving the students more of an opportunity to, to air their viewpoint. So I think the more we can hold ourselves back and elicit more, it's difficult for teachers. You know, teachers love talking, and we've got the expertise, and we want to tell them, we want to show our enthusiasm, but I think sometimes, holding yourself back and eliciting more instead of jumping in and passing judgment 
Because I think it was the same mistake I made with that student who kept coming and saying to me, I've got a new plan, I've got a new plan. I think she perceived, rightly or wrongly, she perceived me as making a judgment of what she was doing. And I think if I'd held myself back and said, well, what do you think about it? What do you think of the strengths and weaknesses of what you're doing? It might have had a more fruitful outcome. A question touching on the, 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 the idea of the motivation for applying feedback. Mm. Uh, many of the courses I'm involved with have um, a feedback stage built into a, a course assignment. Good. So there's a, a deadline for students to submit a draft and the teacher gives feedback on the draft. Um, now, after that, some courses I'm involved with flirt with the idea of awarding some kind of grade mm. to the application of the feedback. Mm. Is that generally a good practice or not? <coughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I don't think so. No. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Uh, there are some examples in the literature of people doing that, and generally I would be tentatively positive to it because I think it's seeding student feedback mm. literacy. It's seeding the idea that students should actually use the feedback. Now, in an ideal world, they would do this without you having to give the carrot of the grade. Mm. But I think we know what students are like, and if, if you don't give a grade for something, there's a similar argument with peer feedback. We would really like them to do good peer feedback independently and without a grade. But some people feel if you add, say, 10% of the marks or 15% for the quality of the peer feedback, they will give peer feedback better. Yeah. Now, I think from a theoretical point of view, that's not great. And it'd be better that they just did it because you could sell the rationale. But I, I think that's a pragmatic compromise. And I feel a bit the same for that one. I mean, it would be nice if they would act on the feedback without you having to push them. But if giving a small percentage of the marks is actually pushing them to do something that is actually good for them, I think I would be okay with it. Um, good assessment is the art of compromise. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.